morning. It's a joy to visit with you today. I'm always excited when Pastor Ron calls me on the phone, tells me he's going to be away. Could you fill in on such and such a Sunday? I think he called me a couple of months ago, and uh, I got it on my calendar to make sure that I would I would get, be here, not forget to come. So it's a joy to be with you. If you have your Bibles, we're going to Acts chapter 12 this morning. Acts chapter 12. I'm going to begin reading for you at verse number 5. Peter was kept in prison. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side, woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off. Peter's wrists. Let's pray. Father, again we come to you in the avenue of prayer. And we are so grateful for the privilege that we have, the honor that we have to enter into your presence through prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you hear us and that it's your desire to hear from us, not just on Sunday morning, Lord, but as we pray during the week for ourselves and for one another, and for our country and for the world, we ask, Lord, that you would listen and intercede in our behalf for the needs of our, of our home, the needs of our church, and the needs of one another. We thank you, Lord, that we can worship together as a congregation on Sunday morning. We thank you for the privilege of the freedom of worship that we have yet to still in this country. And might, Lord, that continue, we ask. In Christ's name, amen. amen. If I were to put a title to my message this morning, I would entitle it, The Great Escape. We're going to break it down into three parts. So let me share with you these three thoughts this morning. Number one, a persecuted church. Number two, an obedient apostle. And number three, a praying congregation. When we come to chapter 12 in the book of Acts, we read these words in verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. What does the scripture mean about this time? Well, you have to go back to chapter 11 to find out what the author is talking about. Because of the persecution that took place during the time of Stephen, when he was martyred, the church was scattered throughout the then known world. People traveled hundreds, even thousands of miles to different locations because of the persecution that had occurred. Now we hear often about the persecution of the church the persecution of Christians. Religious persecution has always existed. It's always been a difficult thing for people to face. Not just Christians, but also other religions in the world have experienced tremendous persecution. I think of the country of Tibet, which has been persecuted by the country of China. And persecution takes place so often in the world with different religious organizations. I think of the persecution that the Jewish people have experienced down through the ages, especially the persecution that took place during World War II against the Jewish people. Even the Muslim people have been persecuted. In the 1400s, they were all forced out of the country of Spain and they were no longer uh, 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 able to live there. I was born and raised in the state of Maryland. And in the state of Maryland, Maryland was established 
for a haven for Roman Catholics because they were being persecuted by the Protestants in colonial days. And so Maryland was drawn up as a haven for Roman Catholics to have the freedom of worship and a place where they could worship without being persecuted. So persecution within the church has always existed. Religious persecution has always existed and will exist until the end of time. And so when we read in these words, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some that belonged to the church intending to persecute them. Well, what had happened in chapter 11 is that because of the scattering of the believers from the city of Jerusalem, they traveled to various places and set up new residence there. We're told here in chapter 11 that many of the residents of Jerusalem moved to a town called Antioch, which is about 200 miles north of the city of Jerusalem. And there they established residence in this town of Antioch. And they began to share their faith with the people in the city of Antioch. Antioch was a very large and prosperous city at that time. And so as they shared their faith, many came to faith in Christ. Word reached Jerusalem 200 miles to the south that a great revival was occurring in the city of Antioch. And so the religious leaders in Jerusalem chose Barnabas to go to Antioch and to find out what was happening. So that's what Barnabas did. Barnabas left Jerusalem, he went to Antioch, and we're told that when he reached the city of Antioch and he saw what was happening in the development of the church, he became overwhelmed, he became thrilled at what was going on. And as a result of that, he went to a city named Tarshish for a man named Saul and brought Saul to Antioch with him and for a whole year they ministered in the city of Antioch together. Now as I read that one verse about Barnabas going to Tarshish to look for Saul, I say to myself, what if Barnabas hadn't done that? What if Barnabas had not even been concerned about a man by the name of Saul? How much different would our New Testament be today? Saul, or the Apostle Paul, wrote the bulk of our New Testament. If Barnabas, in his heart, had not felt burdened to go to Tarshish and bring Saul back to Antioch and minister together for a whole year to give Saul an opportunity to minister, the New Testament would be completely different today than what we read it. And so God uses one individual to influence another individual to bring about his will in the church and within our hearts and lives. And so there in the city of Antioch, a great revival took place. And, and, and it was as a result of that that we're told that Herod decided that he would persecute the church. He would put some in prison and he would also put some to death. We read in verse 2, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. And this happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a feast that the Jewish people celebrated from the time of their exodus from the land of Egypt. It was a feast that followed Passover, and it lasted seven days. And as a result of that, they ate unleavened bread or bread that had no yeast. Now, back in the book of Exodus, we're told how this came about. The Israelites journeyed from Amasis to Succoth, and they were about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So it's estimated that when the Jewish people left the captivity in the land of Egypt, there could have been as many as 2 million Jewish people at that time. Now, if you remember, when they went down to Egypt, 
because of the famine that took place in Palestine, there were how many went into the land of Egypt? Do you recall? Seventy. Seventy left Palestine and went to Egypt because of the famine. And over a period of 430 years, they grew to approximately 2 million souls. And there we read that, that with the dough that they had brought from Egypt, they baked cakes of unleavened bread. The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of the land of Egypt and did not have time to prepare food for themselves. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread followed Passover uh, and lasted for approximately seven days. Now Passover occurs in the spring of the year, usually at the end of March, the beginning of April. And as a result of that, it's, it's somewhat chilly and cold in the land of Israel during that period of time. I remember my first visit there. Uh, I arrived in the city of Jerusalem on March the 1st. I uh, drove down from the city of Damascus in Syria, and we entered the city of Jerusalem on the, on the day of March 1st, and there was six inches of snow on the ground in the city of Jerusalem. It was very cold, very snowy at that time. So Peter was arrested during the time of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And we're told that after arresting Peter, Herod put him in prison, handing him over to the guards by four squads of four soldiers each. And Herod intended to bring him out for a public trial after the Passover. So now we don't know how long Peter was in prison. Could have been several days, could have been several weeks. But he was in prison for a period of time because of Herod's hatred toward the believers and toward the church. Now, there were many Herods during biblical times. From about 40 years before Christ up to 70 years after Christ, there were at least five men who were called Herod. Now, Herod is not a name but it's a title. And, and, and as a result of that, we read about five different Herods in New Testament times. And this was Herod Antipas, who put James to death by the sword and who uh, uh, arrested Peter and put him in prison. So we read in verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter on the side. Now, I was curious about Peter being struck on the side, what did that really mean uh, as a result of the angel striking Peter? Well, I went to several other uh, texts, uh, different scriptures, and I found that one of the texts said that the angel of the Lord shook Peter. And then another one said that he gently smote him. And then another one said that... Uh, that uh, he was touching Peter on the side. And then another one said that he tapped him on the shoulder. Well, we don't know how exactly this angel woke Peter up, but Peter was awakened by this angel that appeared in his cell where he was being held prisoner. So suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side, woke him up, quick, Get up, he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. Now, it's amazing. This, this bright light filled the cell. Peter was awakened. The angel of the Lord was there, but none 
of the guards experienced what was happening. They remained in a deep sleep. They were not aware that Peter was being rescued, that Peter was being taken uh, from the prison cell into freedom. And so the angel of the Lord said to Peter, quick, get up. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. And then the angel of the Lord said to him, and he gave Peter four commands. And Peter obeyed all four of these commands. Notice what they were. The angel of the Lord said to Peter, put on your clothes. Now when prisoners in biblical times were put into prison, they had to remove their clothes. One of the reasons that they removed their clothes is so that if they tried to escape, it would not be likely that they would want to go out into the public with no clothes on. So the clothes were taken off of the prisoners and Peter was in the prison without his clothes. So the angel of the Lord said, put on your clothes. And then the angel of the Lord said, put on your sandals. And then the angel of the Lord said to him again, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Now the reason that Peter had to put the cloak around him is because again, it was in the early spring of the year and it was a very cold morning in the city of Jerusalem. So the angel of the Lord told Peter to put on his clothes, his sandals, to put his coat around him, and he was to follow me. And so Peter was obedient to the voice of the angel. Now the angel had been sent to Peter by the Lord himself. And therefore, by Peter obeying the angel, Peter was obeying the Lord himself. It is essential that as we travel through life, as we journey this path, that we are obedient to the Lord. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells us in the Old Testament with regards to the life of Saul, who was the king of Israel, that God prefers obedience even over sacrifice. So there are things that we think we can do to please the Lord. But in doing those things, if we are not walking in obedience with him, those things that we do to try to please the Lord are for naught. Because God's desire is that we, that we be obedient. And Peter was obedient to the voice of the angel, instructing Peter through the Lord himself that he was to get up, he was to put on his clothes, he was to put on his sandals, he was to put his cloak around him, and he was to follow the angel. And the angel said to him, Peter, follow me. And so Peter followed the angel of the Lord out of the prison. But he had no idea what the angel was doing and what was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. Peter thought that he was dreaming. He couldn't believe that this was reality. He thought he was having a vision. And so they passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gates that lead to the city. It opened all by itself and they went through and as they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left Peter. Then Peter came to himself. It dawned on him, I'm not dreaming. This is not a vision. This is reality. The angel of the Lord has released me from prison. And I was to be called to trial the following day. And so Peter was released from prison. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything that the Jewish people were anticipating to do to me. So Peter came to reality. They're on the street outside of the prison as the angel left him. When we read on, we read in verse 12. When this had dawned on Peter, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, 
also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Now we're told earlier, back in verse 5, that while Peter was in prison, the church was earnestly praying for Peter. And so we're reminded here again that he went to the house where the people were gathered and they were praying. Now, it would have been in the middle of the night when Peter was rescued from the prison by the angel of the Lord. And at that time of the morning, there was a group of church members who were still gathered in the house of Mary, praying that Peter would be released from prison. We're told that Peter went to that house. He knocked on the outer door and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and she explained, Peter is at the door. The church responded, you're out of your mind. Peter's in prison. He can't be at the door. And when she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel, or in some renditions, it must be his ghost. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet, and he described how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Now here Peter appears at the house of Mary, John Mark's home, and they are astonished at the fact that Peter is not in prison. They were praying that he would be released from prison. Peter is released from prison, and they can't believe that it happened. Do you ever pray? And in the back of your mind, your thought is, God will never answer this prayer for me. It's too difficult. I'm asking for too much. Uh, do we really believe when we pray that our prayers are going to be answered? Because here was a church that was filled with the Holy Spirit. They were advancing in the city of Jerusalem and throughout the world. God was blessing them in a phenomenal way. They were praying for the release of Peter from prison. And when it happened, they couldn't believe it happened. When we pray, we need to pray believing that God is going to answer our prayer. If we don't have the faith that God will respond to the prayer and the cry of our heart, then why pray? If we don't have faith that God's going to answer our prayer, then why pray? Here the church was praying for Peter's release. It happened. They couldn't believe that it had happened. So they let Peter in. Peter a motion with his hand for them to be quiet, and he described how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. Now, we're not told where Peter went, but anyhow, he went away to a place that was probably secure, where Herod would not be able to find him, Herod would not be able to arrest him again, and either persecute him or even put Peter to death. This is a transitional verse in the book of Acts. When we're told that Peter left and went to another place, the ministry of Peter comes to an end in the book of Acts. And the ministry of Barnabas and Paul begins at this point. And the remainder of the book of Acts is the ministry of the Apostle Paul and Barnabas as they travel on their first missionary journey, and then the Apostle Paul with Silas traveling on several more missionary journeys. And so I ask you today, when we pray, do we really believe that we're going to have an answer to our prayer? We live in a world today where the church is being tremendously persecuted. We hear about that all the time persecution of the church on Christian radio, Christian TV. Pastors are arrested from the pulpit and put right into prison. Believers are removed from the house of worship and persecuted and put into prison. And so we live in a world today where the church is persecuted. 
persecuted from the very beginning of the church, and it has never come to an end. When we think of the life of the Apostle Peter, Peter was an obedient individual. He failed his Lord at one time. He denied even knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. But Christ forgave him, gave him a new opportunity to become a leader within the church, and he became an obedient apostle. And then are we a praying congregation? When we pray, do we really believe that God's going to respond and answer our prayer? I trust that that is so. Let's pray. Father, we bow in your presence so grateful for the privilege that we have to pray. It is an honor to be able to enter into your very presence through the avenue of prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you love us. You love us with an everlasting love, and you promised that you would never leave us. You said, I'll never forsake you. I'm with you always, even to the very end of the world. And so today we come to you thanking you for who you are, how you work in our lives. And I pray, Lord, that we would be an obedient church, that we would be a praying church. Even if we face persecution, Lord, in our lives, might we be faithful and continue to walk with you and to serve you because you are so faithful to us. This we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.